Welcome. I'm Dr. D. Todd Harrison, and we're here today to continue to study the words of Jesus Christ as taught in the Holy Scriptures. Today, we're looking at the, we continue to look this year at the Old Testament, uh, as the Old Testament bears witness and testifies of the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And of that same Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, I testify as one of his witnesses that he lives today. He is our Lord, our God, our Redeemer, our Savior, our all. We're looking today at the great stories of David and Solomon, Israel's two greatest leaders, two greatest kings. Uh, they uh, started their lives with their hearts full of, of uh, uh, devotion to God, but f they fell and lost their exaltations. Their exaltations, as the Doctrine and Covenants say, have gone to another. It doesn't specify that in terms of Solomon, but we get the picture from what DNC 132 39 says of David. And so let's look today at the last week we looked at uh, David and the, the great story of his uh, uh, devotion to God as a youth, his uh, battle against Goliath and uh, killing the giant, and all these great things that uh, David started off his life. Uh, let's look here today at uh, 2 Samuel, and we'll look first to chapter 5, verse 10 through 13. So 2 Samuel chapter 5, and uh, verses 10 through 13. It says, And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Sounds like Jesus Christ, right? In the beginning of the Gospels, Jesus Christ grew great. Talks about how he continued to grow and increase, you know, and grew great, right? So. David, you know, he's doing everything right. And the Lord of God, the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. He was honored by this foreign king, King uh, uh, Hiram. And, uh, and they built him a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. And that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. And so what did David do? David took in more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. So instead of giving thanks to God, what did he do? He started to uh, marry several uh, women, several wives here, uh, which is going to start to, uh, as people indulge in different behaviors and they can develop addictions, right? And so here he develops this, he starts to develop this sexual addiction, which is going to lead to his downfall uh, with, uh, with Bathsheba, right? So, you know, instead of thanking God, instead of continuing to grow great in the Lord, as it said in verse 10, he starts to marry other women, starts to indulge in his appetites, his sexual passions, developing sexual addictions. Let's look now at uh, chapter 6, verse 4 through 7. Uh, now, David, while he's developing a sexual addiction, he's still trying to praise the Lord. He's out here he, he's trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and transport the uh, Ark of the Covenant here. And we get the great lesson of Uzzah, right? Of Uzzah here, chapter 6. And we'll look at verse 4 through 7. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gebeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord in all manner of instruments. So he's really playing his way, you know, playing his heart out to the Lord. Made of firwood and even of harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Utsa, saw that the oxen were shaking the ark, right? So he sees that the ark's about to fall. He's worried it's going to crash, it's going to break. What does Usa do? He reaches out to hold on to the ark, right? To steady it so it did not crash. It says here, And the anger of the Lord, in verse 7, was kindled against Uza, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, why did God do that? Was it not a good thing to steady the ark, to for Utsa to reach out and to make sure that the ark did not fall to the ground? 
That's what we have, you know, in today's society, these kind of people like that, right? No, it was not his responsibility to steady the ark. His responsibility was only to help in the transport of the ark. Only the Levites from the tribe of Levi could touch the ark, right? So he's not allowed to touch the ark. He's not of the tribe or the uh, blood line uh, of those who could do that. This was no different than those in the modern day society who just decide out, out of the blue that they want to start their own church. Well, after all, having a church is good, isn't it? Isn't that a good thing? Wasn't helping the ark not fall was the, and, and break, was that not a good thing? No, right? What are they doing? Today's uh, pastors and, and ministers, they preach the gospel without having divine authority, without having been called by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who have the proper authority to preach God. And so they go out just like their modern day utsas, right? And so they go out and think they're doing the right thing, you know, but they have not been appointed to preach in God's name. They haven't been appointed to steady the ark. Therefore, God's anger is kindled against them, just as it was against Utsa. Now, he usually doesn't kill them and strike them dead right away, but they are going to die spiritually, as we see in Matthew 7, for example, where in the last days, in the day of their judgment, these false ministers, false pastors, false teachers, will come before the, the judgment throne of Jesus Christ, and they will say, but Lord, in your name we preached. In your name we performed miracles. In your name we cast out devils and did all these wonderful things. And what does God say? What does Jesus Christ, the judge of the, of the living and the dead, say to them? Depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. They were doing so without God's authority, God did not call or appoint them to such positions. They did it upon themselves, just like Utsa. They are guilty of the penalty of death. So where he didn't kill them physically on the earth, he will kill them spiritually as they have to depart from his presence. Now, I've looked at this uh, several times uh, before. At the same time, we have Romans 8, 28, that God uses all things for good. Right, So he uses the good things and the bad things for good. So on the one hand, while these pastors and ministers are going forward and evangelists are going forward and condemning themselves to hell, condemning themselves to be cast out from, uh, from heaven and have Jesus Christ declare that he never knew them, that they're workers of iniquity, uh, what does God do uh, currently? Well, he uses them, right? He does use them. He allows them to condemn themselves, but he uses that for good, to pre help prepare people, at least to have some notion of Jesus Christ, some notion of the gospel, some notion of some of the principles, maybe baptism, maybe something, uh, some kind of teaching about repentance and, and the Holy Ghost and, and uh, Holy Spirit, these, these kinds of things. So use them to keep his name abroad upon the earth, or to, especially as he did the last 2,000 years, keep his name abroad upon the earth, so that people, when they recognize and are, have the opportunity to join his church, his true church, then the people will already know who Jesus Christ is. They will already be familiar with faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it's easier for them to recognize the truth, to embrace it and become a member of the church. So he uses them on the one hand, but at the same time, they're condemning themselves to hell because they're exercising, they're not exercising proper priesthood authority and they've not been called by revelation or prophecy. In fact, most of them will declare that there is no more revelation, that there is no more prophecy. So I don't know how they think that they, they've they been called by God if God doesn't speak to humankind anymore. If they don't believe that God speaks, that God does not uh, give revelation, prophecy, I don't know how they think they can be, a, be called by God to be a pastor. Right? So that's what happens to them. This great lesson here about Utsa in modern day evang evangelicals, uh, evangelists, pastors, and, uh, and ministers uh, who uh, proclaim that they speak in the name of God. First thing Jesus Christ did, not only did he talk like this, right, in Matthew 7, but he always condemned uh, uh, when he was on the earth those false religious uh, leaders of whom he did not personally call and uh, authorized to go preach in his name. 
What was the first thing he said to, to it, after two thousand years of of uh, you know of no revelation being upon the earth, right? No prophets, no apostles being called by God. What's the first thing he said when he appeared to Joseph Smith, right? Join none of those churches. Why? Because he did not establish those churches. He did not command any of their founders to found those churches. They did so without the, the proper authority and priesthood of God. They did so without revelation, without prophecy. Then what did he say? That those ministers, just the same Jesus Christ, right? The exact same Jesus Christ in the New Testament, same Jesus Christ of the Doctrine and Covenants and the Latter-day uh, Gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Well, just as we'd expect him to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. He said to the prophet Joseph Smith, these ministers, that they are corrupt, uh, that they uh, worship him with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him, that, they're, uh, uh, that their beliefs in the, uh, in the creeds of Christendom are false abominations in his sight, right? That's exactly what we'd expect Jesus Christ to say. Those of us who've studied the historical Jesus in the New Testament, we would know that that's exactly what Jesus would say, and that's what Jesus did say. So the great lesson here of uh, Utsa. Okay, let's uh, go on now to chapter 7. And David now even offers to build a house to the Lord. He says, I'm living in this nice palace. The Lord, you know, the Lord has, you know, doesn't have a house. It's as it's, it's fine as mine. So why don't we go ahead and um, and, and build, uh, you know, it says in verse 2, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Oops. <laughs> There's a mistake, right? Remember, as apostles and prophets, apostles and prophets need to speak the word and will of God. They don't, they are not to uh, utter their own personal opinions, their own uh, uh, beliefs of what should or should not take place. Here he tells David, go ahead and go build a, 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 a temple or something to, to God, uh, you know, thinking that that's a good thing, right? So he has to get reprimanded by God next, right? So in, in verse 4, and it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, ko amar Adonai, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in. He says, so I've not commanded any of you to build a house for me to dwell in at this point of time, right? But uh, nevertheless, he, he goes on and, uh, you know, he talks about, um, let's look at um, uh, verses 12 through 17. And when thy days be fulfilled, when, when you shall die and sleep with your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of man and with the stripes of the children of man. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. He's been promised here the Messiah, that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be born, uh, you know, from, from his loins. He would be a, an ancestor of Jesus Christ, uh, that uh, Solomon be great on the earth, that Solomon will be the one to build uh, the temple. So now David in the next verses goes and he prays and he thanks God for these uh, blessings. All right, let's move now over to chapter 11. And here we get the great story. So David and Bathsheba here. So let's look here now, verses 1 through 5. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forward to battle, right? So at the end of the year, kings go forward to battle. Where should David be? Going to battle, right? What does David do? He stays home, right? First mistake, right? If he had been where kings should be and where their tradition was, where kings should be, he should have been out with his man fighting. And instead, he's at home lusting after, uh, the, you know, the woman and thinking uh, things other than warfare, right? And uh, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. 
And it came to pass in the evening that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So instead of quickly turning away and looking at something else, he starts to watch her more closely and starts to imagine things in his mind and gets carried away in the lust of his heart. He then uh, sends his uh, servants to go get her. He even finds, <laughs> watch this one, verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. <laughs> okay, so. Here it is, you know, and how often does this sound familiar, right? Where some people will keep the lesser commandment and ignore the greater commandment. Here David's so worried he's going to commit adultery with somebody, uh, you know, that hasn't been purified from her un from her uncleanness. Uh, from, you know, basically uh, if, if she had recently had her period and now went through the, the time to to become uh, clean once again, according to the uh, to the Mosaic uh, ceremony and Mosaic uh, law, but so now that she's clean and not unclean, now it's okay to commit adultery with her, right? So he, he he's so determined and he's so careful to obey the lesser law that he, he ignores and and uh, you know and commits the the greater uh, sin here, the actual sin of adultery. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, saying, "I'm with child." So now David starts to panic. He uh, Sends for Uriah. He uh, entertains Uriah. Uh, he, you know, says, "Look, uh, uh, how's Joab doing? How's your, how's the army doing?" And, he's, and then he tries to send him home, but he finds out that Joab's so faithful. He thinks, "How can I go home to my wife and and family when none of my men are, uh, are able to do so? They're all uh, fighting. So I'm just going to sleep at the at the door here of, of King David." So he stays the night. There is so faithful guy, and remember, he's a Hittite. He's not the, an Israelite. He's not the, you know, he wasn't born in the church. He, he didn't grow up in the church, right? He's a convert, but he's so faithful uh, uh, to Israel, right, and, and to the people of God. And so then, ultimately, David sends with Uriah a note to Joab, the general, uh, to go ahead, send Uriah up to the front lines and let him be killed off. And so the, uh, that, that's what uh, happens here. And so Uriah is killed here in battle. And so now David's committed adultery and he's committed murder. Now, with the adultery, yes, he could have repented of that. Yes, he could have received forgiveness of that. But the problem is he's now added murder uh, to it. Murder is, as we know from Jesus Christ in the New Testament, as well as Doctrine and Covenants, other places, is not a uh, sin that you can be forgiven in this life. So you commit uh, murder, it's you know, basically all over for you. Uh, uh, you will not receive exaltation in the celestial kingdom. So even though this faithful David, whose heart was uh, tended to be with the Lord, he uh, composed many of the Psalms in the book of Psalms, praising the Lord. He was a very prayerful man. He had a lot of faith in God, but yet, uh, he will not, as Doctrine and Covenants 132, 39 says, that his exaltation and his wife's went to another. So a very sad fall from, from grace, fall uh, from uh, his exaltation. Uh, he was then uh, promised through his faithfulness and trying to repent of his sin and, and to come unto the Lord, that the Lord would not leave his soul forever in hell, in spirit prison, but that one day he would be redeemed. He'll come forward in the telestial kingdom, uh, which is a kingdom of glory, a kingdom of heaven, but far from the celestial glory, uh, which he could have had had he remained faithful to the Lord. Now we get the great story here with Nathan. So Nathan now is told by God to go talk to David about this. So uh, let's look at chapter 12, verse 1 through 14. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of its own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. 
And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for that wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. And so that Nathan, and, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing, because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee basically anything you wanted, right? How remarkable is that? David, God brought from being a shepherd, watching sheep, to being the king over Israel and the most powerful king that Israel had had up to this point of time. I, I, he said he gave him the throne. He gave him his, uh, the former king's wives. He gave him anything that, that he wanted. And if it had been too little for him, anything that he had asked for, God would have given to him. Just as he had his master's wives, that would seem to imply, if we take it literally, that he could have had Bathsheba had he done it the right way. Had he not forced things, had he not committed the adultery, had he not uh, murdered Uriah, if he had just asked God for Bathsheba, God would have given Bathsheba to him. That was the proper way. We know, obviously, that Solomon is was anointed to be the next king. Solomon is going to be born through Bathsheba, right? Therefore, that was God's plan all along that he end up with Bathsheba. The difference was is he forced things, took it upon himself, failed to ask God, and has now lost his exaltation and eternal life because of that decision. And uh, But if he had just asked, God, God would have given him Bathsheba. Really powerful lesson again here in this Old Testament. Okay, so now let's see. Um, let's now move on then to so this chapter, uh, uh, chapter 12. And uh, okay, now we'll move on to Kings. So we're going to move to 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're going to get Solomon here, and we'll see his downfall as well. Very sad uh, lesson here today. And uh, so 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. And, Sol uh, um, and Solomon loved the Lord. So again, just like David starting off on the right track, he loves the Lord. He's keeping God's commandments. Walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sanctified and burnt incense in high places. So not exactly right. He's starting to sacrifice in places where he shouldn't be, but he's still worshiping the Lord at this at this stage. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Wow, he's you know he's really paying a lot of tithing here, paying a lot of fast offerings, right? Sacrificing all these animals. And, and verse 5, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. So he sees God in a dream. We know from Numbers 12, 6, that qualifies him as a prophet, right? How do you know that there's a prophet among Israel? I, the Lord God, will appear to him in a dream, right? That's Numbers 12, 6. So Solomon here has qualified himself to be a prophet. He's the king of Israel. He's also a prophet. He says here, and uh, and Solomon said in verse 6, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or how to come in. I lack basic wisdom and knowledge. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered and no counted for multitude. 
Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, because if God normally would say that, ask somebody to, you know, what they wanted, they would say riches, a nice house, uh, you know, these uh, sort of things, right? So verse 11, and God said to him, because thou hast asked this thing, this wisdom, to be able to judge his people, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches, nor has asked the life of thine enemy, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. I will give you this great wisdom. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee. No, no, no one is wise as you. That has been before you, Solomon, neither after you shall any arise like unto you. Wow, how mighty powerful that must be. And I've also given thee that thou which thou hast not asked, because you didn't ask for it, I'm going to bless you with riches and honor. So there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. You'll be the richest king. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will also lengthen your days. You will live a long time. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he comes to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings as thanks to God. So Solomon really, his heart is there. He's being blessed by God. Let's look at verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. So the next uh, verse here is that great story between the uh, uh, the, the two harlots have the, uh, both have a baby. Uh, they're sleeping in the same house. Uh, one rolls over and smashes and kills the baby. She then goes over, takes the living baby from the other woman, and then pretends it's her kid. So now they go before King Solomon, and and you know they're both saying, "Well, no, our mine's the living one. Hers is the dead one. The other one says the same thing. Mine's the living." That not the dead one. And so Solomon decides, okay, let's bring forward a sword. He brings forward a sword, and he, he says, let's do this. Let's cut the baby into two, and we'll give one half to this woman and one half to the other. At which point the true mother said, no, 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 go ahead, give it to, the, give it to her, let the child live. So Solomon knew that was the true mother. And so therefore all Israel recognized this great wisdom, this great judgment that Solomon had, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. And uh, verse four, we get some further blessings of Sol Chapter four, we get some further blessings of Solomon, 29 through 34. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceedingly much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore, and Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country. The Magi, remember, we're going to hear about them more when, when we get to the New Testament. But, but he excelled even the wisdom of the Magi and the astrologers over in Babylon. And all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. At the end of verse 31, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 Proverbs. 3,000, I think there's what, 30 in the... Book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. So he he, he did uh, uh, t you know ten times uh, what uh, ten times ten times uh, ten to uh, hundred a uh, hundred times right a hundred times more uh, proverbs than are in the Book of Proverbs right. Again, lost scripture that's not uh, been you know lost at some point of time, but probably should be included in the Bible. And his songs were a thousand and five. Well, where are those thousand and five? Songs that could have been in in the book of Psalms with David. So we, we lost a lot of this great wisdom and this great devotion to God, uh, the Solomon, in his Proverbs and in his Psalms. Those who think the Bible is complete are really mistaken. They haven't read the Bible to see all these things that we're missing. We continue to point out all the multiple times this year in these lessons, all the great uh, books that are missing and all these great Psalms and Proverbs and so forth. And there came in verse 34 of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. So it was really, truly being blessed. Heart is really with God. 
And let's look now at chapter 8. Now, chapter 8 is one of the great chapters. This is the temple dedica uh, dedicatory prayer, the very first temple dedicatory prayer, uh, which we have record or knowledge uh, of. So it's great that you would all um, read chapter 8 uh, after this video tonight and uh, really look at this great uh, uh, prayer. It's the first temple dedication prayer that we have record of. Uh, let's go ahead and skip to the end of that prayer and uh, look at 54, verse 54 through 62. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he had rose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And let these my words learn, and I have made supplication before the Lord, be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in the statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. So powerful uh, the, the chapter here in chapter 8. Chapter 9, the Lord appears once again to Solomon. So he sees the, the Lord twice right he's very faithful here he's having visions revelations of the lord he's dedicated he's de de dedicating temples to god his heart is really with the lord so what a horrible downfall we're about to uh, witness here okay now we'll move here to uh let's look at the um now they start to you know warn him right in uh, in the uh, here as well that if you follow uh the lord you, you know, you'll be blessed once again. This goes back to Moses. But if you don't, you'll be cursed, not neutral. There's no neutrality. You know, a lot of people think there's neutral. Well, I just won't follow the Lord and I'll just be neutral here. There's no neutrality. You're either blessed or you're cursed. And so once again, in chapter 9, talks about the, the, the how you'll be cursed if you don't keep the commandments. In uh, chapter 10, we get the great uh, visit of Queen uh, Sheba, who goes and visits uh, uh, Solomon. And uh, now this is very important in the Ethiopian uh, culture in the in country of Ethiopia. Uh, they believe that, uh, uh, that, that, that this is one of their favorite uh, chapters of scripture. And uh, 23 through 25, let's see. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to, uh, uh, to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man is present vessels of silver vessels of gold and so forth now earlier in this chapter uh in verse 13 and king solomon gave unto the queen of sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked beside that which solomon gave her of his royal bounty so she turned and went to her own country she and her servants now according to ethiopian legend this included a son she asked a son from solomon so she got he, she got pregnant by solomon and the, and her son becomes the founding uh, leader of the Ethiopian dynasty. Uh, at some point along the, the the line here, they also believe that uh, the other gift that uh, Solomon gave uh, to his son and uh, and the, this uh, Queen Sheba uh, was the Ark of the Covenant. So they today they think they have the Ark of the Covenant, and they have somebody who dedicates their life to. Uh, watching over it and this uh, tent and so forth. So it's one of the possibilities. We don't know. There's, there's uh, one of the possible possible legends, uh, other legends. Maybe there are three different arcs. Uh, it looks like uh, maybe even the uh, Hopi Indians ended up with one of uh, these possibility, uh, one of these possible uh, uh, arcs, uh, uh, Ark of the Covenants. Uh, Hugh Nibley talks about that, at, uh, some detail 
uh, about how the uh, Hopi Indians believe that they came from the uh, city to the south, the, the, red, the uh, uh, red city from the south. We know that uh, Zarahemla means the, uh, the red city. And, and so therefore uh, the Hopi may be these descendants of, of the um, you know, Mulekites who came over. And that's certainly a possibility that when the Babylonians were coming in to conquer the, the temple and conquer Jerusalem in 588 to 586 BC, that they may have gotten not only Mulek, one of the sons of King Zedekiah out of there and over here to the Americas, but that they may have brought also the Ark of the Covenant as well. So those tend to be some of the more uh, uh, stronger uh, possibilities here of, this, of the Ark of the Covenant. But uh, nevertheless, chapter 10 is very sacred in the uh, Ethiopian um, uh, history and, and culture. I know we have uh, Ethiopians who watch our videos, so I thought that uh, we would... Uh, uh, you know, to give you the recognition here for your um, history of your country and, and so forth. Okay, so let's now move on to uh, chapter 11 and we get the downfall. All this great stuff of Solomon. Now what's going to happen here? Chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. But King Solomon, and remember when the scriptures say but, you know something bad's about to happen, right? But King Solomon loved many strange or foreign, many foreign women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, who's not a member of the covenant of God, doesn't worship the God of, of the Bible, right? A woman of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Zidonians and the Hittites. Uh, he's loving all these foreign women, right? And they're all worshiping false gods. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. So he, God warned them, right? God warned them many, many, many times. Solomon claimed unto these in love. So those are the very ones he loved. Now look at this sexual addiction. We saw what happened with David and Bathsheba, but check this out. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wife's turned away his heart. You know, that's a thousand, you know, what, one per day for, for three years? I mean, he wouldn't even recognize, you know, he wouldn't even know all their names of all these women. Really developed a uh, sexual addiction here, just like his father, uh, only much worse. You know, this is much worse than his father had it. And he's just marrying left and right. His, his sexual appetite, sexual addiction is way out of line here. He's, he's marrying these foreign women who are worshiping false gods who are not part of God's covenant people. Don't worship the covenant God of the Old Testament. For it came to pass when Solomon was old. What happens? What God promised, right? That his wife's turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now the JST is going to change some of this stuff, but. The, the point is that David, what the, the biblical writers here doctrinally may not be exactly correct here when they keep talking about David's heart being right. But we see that, you know, he was a devoted guy, to devoted to God. He wrote the Psalms. He, you know, was a very prayerful man. And in those and in those contexts is what they mean when they keep talking about what are these kings, uh, as we're going to start reading about, were, uh, whether their heart was after David or, or not. We're not talking doctrinal. So Joseph Smith changes it doctrinally, you know, that, that you know, David, his father, it went not fully after the Lord and, and so forth, uh, implying that maybe David's heart really wasn't fully right with God doctrinally. Historically, the writers of these, uh, of these historical books are still viewing him as kind of a good example based on his devotion to God. For Solomon... Went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, another word for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father, again, by, by his heart, what the biblical writers are trying to imply here. Probably Joseph Smith, we got something else here in the JST. Then did Solomon build a high place. He actually builds a high place, a you know, basically a temple, a worship center, for Chemish, who you sacrifice uh, children to, uh, infants. The abomination of Moab, and they healed as before Jerusalem, and for Molech also, worshiped by children by sacrificing children. For the ch children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all his 
foreign wives, which burnt incense, sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him. And they say it again for emphasis twice. He had twice seen God face to face. He knew perfectly well who Jesus Christ was. He knew that he was the Lord and Redeemer of this world and that he, he was the true God. And yet he turned his back on the true God and worshiped false gods who he knew to be false. Therefore, Solomon most likely is a son of perdition. He's not even going to get what David got. David at least has salvation, right? He's lost his exaltation in the highest kingdoms in the celestial kingdom, right? He's lost his exaltation. His exaltation has gone to another man. His wives have gone to another man. But Solomon here may have even lost salvation into the telestial kingdom. It's clear he's some sort of son of perdition here. He turned against God, having seen him two times, dedicated God's temple upon the earth, turned away from God to worship false gods. And so he ended his life in that status, probably a high probability of being a son of perdition. He will be one that would be cast out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever and having no light, no no uh, light of God at all, uh, not even to be uh, uh, able to receive the ministering of angels or of the Holy Ghost because of this rebellion that he did against the Lord. So again, very tragic stories here we're reading here in the scriptures with David and with Solomon. And so what great uh, reminders they are that even if we are faithful in our life at this point of time, faithful in keeping God's commandments, faithful in our prayer life, faithful in our scripture reading, that we must maintain that attitude and that right worship with God for the rest of our lives till the moment we die. We don't want to be a David or a Solomon. We want to be a faithful person who continues to remain faithful to God throughout all our, our uh, throughout all the rest of our lives. For those of you who are not yet members of the church of God upon the earth, we invite you in God's name and in his love for you to embrace him, to come unto his church so you can be saved. Ephesians 5.25 says that Christ gave himself for those of his church, not for those that are not members of this church, for those who are members of his church, he gave himself. So it's vitally important to become a member of his church so you can take full advantage of his atonement uh, of, you know, on, on your behalf. I will leave in the description of the video of this video a link to click on it. Reach out to the missionaries. Let them know you're willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Exercise faith in him. Repent of your sins. Become a member of his church and kingdom upon the earth so that you can become a Christian, being anointed by the Holy Ghost, which you will receive after baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. You will then be set right on the path, heading back towards our Heavenly Father's presence. Of him we testify of his existence, that he is alive today. He loves you with a great love that was, that was so full of love that he was willing to die and suffer all manner of afflictions all manner of beatings, all manner of insults to die for you in your place so that God took his wrath against the ungodly and instead of casting that upon you, cast it upon his son. His son stood in your place, received the wrath of God so that you can repent of your sins and receive joy, happiness, and peace forever and ever and ever. Of him I testify as one of his witnesses. And of his gospel we testify as we preached it once again this day. His gospel is true. He has restored his church and kingdom upon the earth. It is continuing to grow and grow in, in preparation for his, soon to, uh, for his soon coming forth in which he will come back the second time, the so-called second coming, and he will reign this time as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Hallelujah to his holy name and Hosanna to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. We leave our testimony with you. We ask God to, uh, to bless you in your lives. For those of you who are trying to be faithful 
that he may bless you with joy and peace and happiness, that he may bless you with the peace to know that you are on the path that's leading back to his presence. We bless you with health and strength, that you will be healthy. We bless you, your intellect and intelligence, that you can be full of wisdom and knowledge and know right from wrong. And have that. we bless you with strength and boldness to walk on his path, even in these last days when so much of the people are turning to the wicked side. And if they ridicule you, we bless you that the, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.